Next up, um, we've got Abdi Grimm. He's giving, no! Yeah, right? Um, he's giving a talk called Confident Code. I think some of you are going to be pleased. This is a much more technical talk uh, than a lot of what we had yesterday. So, uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's welcome Abdi.
ways to make those parts a little bit more confident and straightforward. So the first step is input gathering. And in order to have confident code, we need to be sure of our inputs. So when you talk about uh, input in Ruby, uh, you, you have to talk about duct typing. And duct typing, uh, at its best, duct typing is, is a very confident style of code construction. You, know, you, don't, you don't ask objects about themselves. You don't ask, are you a duck? You don't say, can you quack? Uh, you just treat the object like a duck if it is not. Uh, you assume that it will complain. The opposite of duct typing is uh, something called type casing, where you're switching on the uh, on the type of an object, and this could be as simple as a case statement that has a list of, of types in it, um, or it could be um, checking for the existence of a method. That is a type check as well. Uh, you're type check checking the uh, the type, the kind of that object. Uh, it could be a check for nil. Nil is a type, nil class. And uh, when you're checking for nil, you are doing a type check. You're doing um, this type casing. And there's actually a, a, um, a code smell name for this. It's called the switch smell. And uh, in my experience in Ruby, the most common kind of uh, type casing that you see is uh, checks for nulls, checks for nil. So there are, are I want to show you three <coughs> strategies for dealing with, with uncertainties in input. First of all, um, when in doubt, uh, coerce your arguments into what you want them to be. So Ruby has these, these great conventional methods like 2s, 2i, uh, and uh, the arrayification operator, as I call array, uh, which will coerce a, uh, you know, most objects support them, and it'll coerce the object into uh, what you want it to be. And um, if you look through the Ruby standard libraries, they use this stuff liberally. They use it everywhere. And it works out really well because you can do stuff like this. I'm, right here, I'm, I'm, um, I'm creating a path name object, which is a kind of a wrapper around a, uh, a system path name. And I'm passing it to open. And open is defined in terms of a string. Open expects a, uh, if you look in the documentation, it expects this, a string, which is the name of the file to open. But you can just, but I can just pass this this path name in instead, and it just works because uh, internally, what Open does, one of the first things it does, is it calls 2s on that that uh, that argument. So if you know what you want, um, you know, don't be shy to just like you know throw these everywhere. If you know you need a string, put a 2s on it. If you know you need uh, an array, put a 2a on it, um, or you know a 2i for integer. Uh, you know, if you know what you want, ask for it. And let the object give it to you. Um, array is really is really cool. Uh, I, I, like I said, I think of it, 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 as the arrayification operator, you can give it pretty much anything, and it will give you a sensible array in return. So if you give it an array, it'll give you that same array back. It won't wrap it in another layer of array. It'll just give you the same array back. If you give it a singular object, it'll wrap that in an array, so you get a one element array. Um, if you give it nil, it won't give you a nil inside an array. It'll give you a uh, It'll give you a empty, an empty array, which is generally what you want. So very useful um, coercion. And uh, especially in 1.9, 1, 1. A, uh, a bit more general than 2a. So here's an example of using array. Uh, here's some, some code from CalSay. It, uh, it's taking the list of messages. You can pass either a single message or a list of messages in for the, uh, for the cows to say. And uh, the original code has this case statement where uh, we're checking the type of the message argument. And, uh, and it's, it's this big sort of interruption in the flow of the code where we try to figure out what somebody passed in and do the right thing with it. Apply uh, array to it, and it becomes a one line. Uh, sometimes sometimes the, uh, the default coercions don't give you what you need. Uh, sometimes you need, you need uh, a coercion to a type um, that's a bit more specific. And, uh, and in this case, the uh, decorator pattern can be uh, very helpful. Decorator is a pattern uh, that consists of an object which just wraps around another object, passes most of its calls through that other object, but also adds a little bit of extra. So um, here's some candidate code for that. Uh, in the, in the CalSay method, we want to record, uh, for debugging purposes, we want to be able to log where we put the output. And then there's this option, this out option that you can pass in that 
by default it's going to return the output as the, as the return value. But you, you could also pass in like a, a file object and then it would write the output to that file. Or you could pass in like an I.O. object or anything that, that, uh, that supports the append operator and, uh, and it would just put the output there. But we want to be able to log where we put it for debugging purposes. And we've got this huge chunk of code right in the middle of that method um, whose sole purpose is to record the name of where we put that, that output because none of those, all, all those, those different types of objects, they might, they don't all support like a common interface. So, you know, we've got a path, if it's a file, if it's a file name or if it's a file object, we've got a dot path on it. Um, you know, if it's nil, we can just say it's the return value. If it's something else, well, we can call inspect on it. You know, there's no common interface there. So here's some code um, that, that uh, kind of wraps those in objects specific to, um, in, in objects that will give uh, all those different inputs a common interface. And, um, and what you see here is this is still, this is still type casing. Often you can't completely get away from type casing, but what you can do is kind of isolate it uh, to one place. So what this is doing is it's, it's taking those different input types and it's uh, returning some things with, with a common interface. So file um, goes through um, unmolested because we're just going to use the dot path method. Other things uh, we're, we're uh, returning some special objects for. And uh, the null one isn't very interesting, but what's interesting here is this uh, generic sync, uh, which inherits from simple delegator, and that's a that's a Ruby standard library. It's in the, the delegate uh, library. And what it does is it just gives you a very, very simple delegator, a very simple wrapper object uh, that will pass every method call through. But then you can also define your own method calls in there uh, to override things or to add things. And uh, so what we're doing is we're defining the path method uh, in terms of the, uh, the wrapped object's inspect method in that case. So when we apply this to the code, it becomes a one-liner. Uh, we just uh, pass our, uh, our out of uh, option to that to that cow sync method, which is going to give us something with with a dependably uh, consistent interface in return, and then we can just confidently call dot path on that because we know no matter what we put in there, uh, we're going to get something out that uh, behaves like the sort of duck that we're lo we're looking for. The second way to deal with uh, input uncertainty is to reject uh, unexpected values. There are some values that you cannot coerce into something you want. They are just wrong. There is nothing uh, that you can, you know, good that you can do with them. And eventually, you know, if you left them alone, eventually they probably cause an error somewhere down in that method. You know, they probably cause a no method error or something. But uh, they might take. It might not be immediate. It might be somewhere down in the method. It might not be clear why you're getting that error uh, by the time it actually raises an exception. And uh, you know, it might do some damage before it gets there. So. Um, to avoid this, confident code needs to be assertive about what it accepts and what it doesn't accept. Uh, it needs to state its needs up front. What we're talking about here is, is preconditioned. Uh, you know, that's part of the, the design by contract discipline uh, of programming. But you don't need a whole design by contract framework for this. Uh, you don't even need an assert method. Ruby doesn't give us an assert method out of the box. Um, uh, a simple precondition is something that looks like this. So at the top of the method, you, uh, I'm saying uh, there's there's this cow say option that uh, defines sort of the template of the cow, and then there's all the all these different template files. I mean, there's like a stegosaurus with a top hat and stuff like that. And uh, seriously, you guys have got to like play with this one talking. Um, and uh, it it uh, defines this. So so we've got this this cow file option, and and this is just a check at the very top that's saying if it's defined but it's blank, we can't do anything with that. There's like nothing, it would just break things, there's nothing we can do with that. So we're going to reject it outright by raising an argument error. Um, so that's fine, I mean, that's a precondition. It's a little bit verbose, so if we wanna, um, if we wanna make it a little cleaner, we can define our, uh, um, an assert method of our own, and, uh, and then it becomes, that becomes more of a one-liner. Um, third way to deal with, with unacceptable values is to simply ignore them. So one way to do this is with a guard clause. A guard clause is very similar to a precondition, except it doesn't raise an exception. A guard clause simply uh, exits a method early, and it just returns early. So we've got this, uh, this guard clause at the top of the same method, which says if, uh, 
if the message is nil, yeah, we're type checking. Um, uh, if the message is nil, we can't do anything with that. There's nothing we can do with that. And if we let it go, we're just going to have to keep putting special cases further on down the method um, that are checking for nil. So we put this um, on the outskirts, uh, at the top of the method, at the top of the top level of our API um, that doesn't, we don't let it go any further, we just return an empty string. Uh, some arguments have to be special. Um, in any, you know, in any reasonably complex method, there, there are often cases, um, there are often some kind of special case that you can't avoid. Um, and an object-oriented way to deal with special cases, like special flags, is rather than putting a lot of if statements in, to create a method which represents, or not a method, uh, an object, which represents that special case. And when you do this, um, this you find you can avoid a lot of, of if statements, you can avoid things like try, which are basically compressed if statements. Um, so here's an example of some code that is somewhat uncertain of itself. This code, this, this code what it does, it checks the, uh, the process status variable after the subordinate calce process has finished and checks to see if there was a if there was a, an error in running that process and it's using the uh, the dollar question mark uh, variable in ruby which is the the exit status of the last process executed and the trouble here is that variable may contain a process status object or it may be nil and so you've got a couple of things here you've got uh, uh, let's see, up here, um, we're, we're using and and. We're saying uh, status and and uh, status dot exit status. Because exit status is the, the method that we're actually interested in. Uh, but we have to first check to see if that status is even defined. Um, down here, we just do it a little bit differently. It's the same thing, we're just <laughs> using try from active support to do it. But in both cases, um, you know, we're uncertain about the existence of this, of this object. We can replace that um, with a special case object. In this case, all we care about is dot exit status. Um, we don't care about anything else on that object. And so here's a little a little special case, uh, which I'm, I'm just using open struct to just create a little ad hoc object, not even creating a class for it or anything. Which, if that status variable is nil, we'll just replace it with this little ad hoc special case object, which represents the exit status as zero. And that way, we can now confidently call status dot exit status without worrying about the case where it's nil. No more tries, no more ifs. The special case that you see most often is the special case for nil. Nil flagging some special handling. And the special case uh, handling for nil is more often than not, do nothing. So there's this special case of the special case pattern called the null object pattern. And a null object is an object that responds to any message, any method call, uh, with depending on the implementation, either nil or with just itself again. So uh, it's a very simple pattern to implement. Here's a basic null object. It's just a, just a basic object which has, defines method missing to return self. So any call you make on it is going to return self. Uh, it also reports itself as being nil. And, uh, and then it's handy to define a little helper uh, that I'm calling maybe here, which is just going to check its input value, see if its, in, if its input value is nil, it's going to return a, a null object instead, otherwise it's just going to return whatever you, whatever you passed in. So this is a way of, of converting nils into null objects and leaving other values unmolested. Um, this is uh, what's known as a black hole null object. Because it returns itself from any unknown calls, uh, you can safely make uh, arbitrary chains on one of these. So if you, you can start out you know, with a, uh, you can wrap the original object that might be nil with a maybe, and then you can just chain a bunch of calls on that. And uh, since, and if it turns out to be nil, that'll be a null object. Each successive call will return the same null object. And so it just nullifies the entire call chain. Uh, we can use this in the CalSay code. So we've got this if statement uh, where we say, if the out option is set, then write uh, write the output to it. If it's not set, we, would, we don't want to do that. We can replace that with our null object and then confidently write the output to that because we know that 
even if it's nil, it'll, uh, it'll silently do nothing. You may have noticed that a lot of these uh, patterns are sort of tackling uh, reducing the number of nils in code. I think nil is kind of overused in Ruby code. It means a whole lot of different things. It's the default return value for a lot of Ruby constructs. Um, it's you know the, the value of uh, uninitialized variables. It, uh, it often flags um, certain cases. Um, and, and you see these nil checks all through Ruby code and they tend to just sort of interrupt the flow um, with this minutia. Uh, so I try to get rid of these where I can. One way, uh, one, one thing that's helpful for getting rid of these nils uh, is to use the hash uh, fetch method for instead of the uh, square brackets for getting values out of hashes. Who's familiar with, he with uh, fetch? The number goes up every time I get this talk. This is great. Um, so uh, it's very simple, similar to the square brackets, except you have this fallback action in the block. So you can say, give me this key. If the key isn't there, then do this thing. And you can do, use that a couple of ways. You can use that, uh, you can use that as a very simple uh, uh, assertion. So uh, if you don't give it a block, it'll, it'll raise an exception if that key isn't there. Or you can, if you can define a key raise uh, if, if that required key is not there. You can also use this for defaulting. So instead of raising an exception in that block, you can just set up the default value in that block. And uh, it's uh, a bit more, I think, a bit more explicit than using or and, uh, and uh, reduces the, the number of conditionals in your code. Nil is often used as just sort of the generic default value for things. You know, it's not defined given a nil, whatever. Um, and, uh, and then you get these these error messages that look like this, you know, no method error on nil. Now, what if we, instead of using, instead of just relying on the nil default value, what if we supplied a symbol as the default, as the default fallback value for something? And anybody tell me what is better about this error message? You know what went wrong? <laughs> you can search for where it came from. Exactly. It's, it's, it's got this string in it, so you can search for it. Um, it's got this string in it, no longer set. You can grep for that. And you can find where that default value was, and you can see where you failed to set something. Um, so I really like to avoid using nil as, as the default value for, for any kind of uh, option or variable in my code. And I, yeah, I think it helps a lot. Um, another thing you can use, um, that's, that, that's a good example of something that, that you know, um, you want to break when it's not set. Uh, sometimes you don't want it to break when it's not set. Use a null object. Instead of using a nil, uh, use a null object. This is great for loggers because, you know, you want logging to happen um, sometimes, but sometimes you don't care. And so you can just use a null object for your logger and, uh, you know, nothing will happen whenever those log statements occur. And, uh, and then you can pass in a logger and, and uh, it'll start logging. So um, the second step, the, the, the second of these, these four uh, parts of method is uh, performing work. Uh, and here I just like to keep the, the focus on the work and not on the, the other parts of the method. Um, there are a couple of confident uh, of styles of work that I find kind of lend themselves to confident code. The first is uh, chaining work. We saw that a little bit earlier with the null object. And that's why it's nice. It's, um, it gives you a way to very easily say, do all this stuff if this initial value is here. If it's not here, uh, turn all that, that whole thing into a null object. And that's with, when you chain stuff together, and, and you can very easily do that with a, with a null object pattern. Um, and uh, another uh, sort of related pattern is the iter iterative style. Uh, if you're familiar with jQuery, you, you use this all the time. Uh, if you have this, this uh, if you have a, a jQuery selector, that returns no no results, and then you try to do something with that collection. What happens? Nothing happens. It's it's um, you know it's just a no-op. And uh, the thing about single object operations is that they are sort of implicitly uh, one or error. So it's either there and it works, or it's not there and there's a problem. Uh, iterative style methods are implicitly zero or more. Uh, they don't have that the error case. If there are zero things, then zero things happen. Um, CalSite uses this iterative style. You can pass in a list of mes messages. 
and, um, and it'll, it'll return a cow for each one. If you pass in no messages, it'll return no cows. Um, and there's no, there's, there doesn't need to be any special case checking for that. Step three, um, delivering results. Um, I don't have a lot to say about this, except you know, be nice to your callers. Uh, try to think about a way to give them something, if, if they're depending on your return values, try to think of a way to give them something other than a nil, some, give them something a little bit more um, expressive than a nil. The, the final step in these four parts of a method is handling failure. And, um, and here I just want to say, put the, if you can, try to put the happy path, the, the expected business logic first, um, and then put the error handling at the end, or try to extract it out to other methods. Um, so um, a few ways to extract your error handling out, uh, you, can, you can use a, uh, actually, uh, this, this is an example of, of what I don't like to see in code. This is a failure checking digression right in the middle of code. Uh, so this, we saw this code a little bit uh, earlier, and uh, it's just right smack in the middle of the code. We, we, we run this process, and then immediately we have to check for an error status before we move on. And it just, it sort of, it interrupts the, the narrative flow of that method to talk about something that actually doesn't happen that often, an issue you know, that doesn't really come up that often. So it's, it's, it's very disruptive to the reader. Uh, you can extract that out uh, into something called a bouncer method, whose sole purpose in life is to either raise an exception or not. So it just checks a value, and um, based on that, it raises an exception or, or it just does nothing. Um, so here's an example of applying the bouncer method to that code. We just wrap up the, uh, the code that needs to be checked in this bouncer method, and, uh, and it's much less disruptive to the flow of code. Another thing you can use is, um, is something called a, uh, a checked method. And um, this is a, a great way of, of sort of getting rid of the, uh, the, the, big, the begin rescue end blocks in, uh, in code. I, I really don't like the uh, begin rescue end uh, idiom. I actually kind of think the begin is kind of a code smell. Uh, because what you, you, you tend to see is these, uh, these blocks of error handling right in the middle of some business logic because there's some case that we have to handle. Um, and it just completely throws off uh, the, the story of the method. And this is a great example. There's this rare case where you get an e-pipe error out of that process. And so we have to, we have to wrap and we have to check for that every time we, we interact with the, uh, the sub-process. And uh, a check method is just a method that um, takes uh, one of the library methods and adds a little bit of error check, checking to it, but otherwise behaves exactly the same way as the, uh, the library method. And, uh, and then we can apply that to the code and, um, and, and have it be much less um, disrupted. So when we apply all of these uh, refactorings, we get a result that looks like this. And what you can see is uh, it's now in, that, or in that, that narrative order. It's got the gathering input, and it's got the, the uh, doing work, and then it's got code to take care of returning results. And they're in that order. And all of the error handling code has been extracted and isolated out uh, into separate methods. Um, a few observations about this. It, um, so it does have that, that more coherent, uh, coherent narrative structure. Um, it has a lower complexity. And I'm using that um, you know, in the computer science sense of uh, you know, cyclomatic complexity, fewer branches, fewer, uh, uh, fewer ifs, um, and case statements equals lower complexity. And um, now, so that's nice, but it's not, one thing you may notice is that it's not necessarily shorter. Uh, what you saw, what you just saw was a little bit shorter, but that was because we extracted all this stuff out. We extracted out into null object patterns and, and check methods and stuff like that. So this is not a strategy for making your code as short as, as possible, um, but it is, I think, a strategy for making your code a lot more readable. Uh, why, but why do we care about this? Why do we care about confident code? Why do we care about readability? Um, well, we know from, from research that when you have lower complexity, when you have fewer paths through code, uh, it, it uh, is correlated with fewer bugs in the code. So that's a good thing. Uh, it also tends to be easier to, debug, to debug. Uh, these methods structured this way tend to either fail early or work. And, uh, and finally, 
Uh, and most importantly, it's, it's self-documenting. It, you're creating a method that reads more, more in the way you would explain the method to somebody. And you know, there's this old saying, write code for people first, uh, the computer second. You know, that, that code may need to, com to communicate intent to somebody six months later, who may be you coming back and having no idea what you're doing back then. So you know, be kind to, the, to yourself, be kind to the maintenance programmers coming after, uh, write your code more confidently. Uh, that's all I've got. Um, I wrote a book. If you use that, uh, that, uh, that discount code, you'll get a discount if you don't have it already. Um, that's it. Thank you very much.